I, when um, we talked about doing this course, it was kind of funny. Uh, I circulated to the SBP AXCO a talk I did in September 2012. That is eight years ago <laughs> on metadata, the most boring subject in publishing. And um, it's when we, we had a talk, we had a members meeting back in 2012 and talked a little bit about metadata. And the context was very much ebooks because I think that was a point when um, uh, uh, quite a number of Singapore local publishers were beginning to create, just beginning to create ebooks. And one of the requirements uh, of ebooks, if you send them to vendors, is you have to fill in these spreadsheets with um, metadata about the book, and you actually have to put that metadata inside the EPUB file. So um, the, the subject came up in, in 2012, and we realized that uh, there was a lot to talk about. So here we are um, just eight years later. So here we are in um, eight years later, and uh, it's, uh, I, I think I've changed the title. It's a little bit boring, but it's important, super important. So onwards. Uh, in 2012, the context was that we'd lost a lot of our bookshelf space. If you remember, 2011, 2010, 2011, 2012 was a pretty tough time for trade publishers. Uh, borders closed, page one closed, MPH closed a lot of branches, Times closed a lot of branches. And uh, it became clear that Amazon and Book Depository from overseas, right, the dot-com and the Book Depository in the UK were picking up quite a bit of slack and were gaining market share. And at the time, we estimated about $40, $50 million worth of business was being done um, by Singaporeans buying books from overseas through these web stores. Um, so we lost 30% of bookshelf space, but we didn't lose uh, quite that much in terms of turnover. Uh, I think we definitely lost some. Uh, and, and so what that showed was that the online sales and the online uh, platforms were becoming more important to our business. Well, eight years later, and the COVID restrictions have hit retail hard. I don't know what kind of sales numbers you guys are seeing, um, but it's been a rough um, couple of months to have the physical retail shut off nearly completely. Our online, local online sales uh, players were not super good. I mean, Amazon.sg is pretty new. So they didn't have a huge market share to build on and they increased their market share for sure, but it was from a low base. Um, Localbooks.sg couldn't really operate because they couldn't really deliver books under COVID conditions. All of us who had web stores uh, found that our sales went up a lot, but um, not necessarily enough to replace the missing bookshops. So uh, in the COVID situation, uh, metadata or online sales becomes even more important and the key to online sales is this metadata. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw Olivia's article um, about the changing Singapore book market in the Straits Times some time ago, but there you are, you know, social distancing inside the bookshops, um, the relu basic reluctance to go out uh, unnecessarily and spend a lot of time browsing in a crowded place and so on. Hopefully we're coming out of that in Singapore, but um, it's, it's definitely a concern. And a lot of the changes that happen, some of those changes will kind of crystallize and continue. So like we said, the overseas online book sellers is important, a part of our market. Um, and uh, these were the numbers we based ourselves upon back then. Um, why do they work so well? Because there's no GST, because they offer quote unquote free shipping. Of course, you pay for it in other ways. Uh, they discount very deeply. So you will, I've found a few times some of our books are on sale on Book Depository cheaper than you can find them in a local bookshop, you know, which uh, confuses our customers uh, and, and hurts the sort of pricing proposition. And of course, if you're searching for a book, you know, you start with online and Amazon and the other merchants uh, do a good job of, of um, serving the needs of people who are looking for books online. And now because COVID. So selling books in an online environment is a bit different, right? In a bookshop, you have the wonderful atmosphere, you've got the feeling of choice, you've got whatever 
efforts the bookshop can do to merchandise the book, to put it in the right place, to highlight it, and so on. You just got that feeling of exploration that you get when you go into a bookshop. I mean, even if you're going in, you know you just want to buy one book. You know, somehow I think most consumers can't help browsing a little bit, getting excited by what they see, and so on. Online, that kind of discovery, that kind of, wow, what is out there? Look at this, all this choice I have. That kind of excitement is a little bit harder to generate. Um, it's a less, much, 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 much less rich environment. The book covers are, you know, so big. Uh, you can only fit 10 books in a shop window, whereas in a, a you know, retail shop, you can do a lot, you can make much more beautiful displays. And that leads to even more concentration on bestsellers. Um, it leads people to be a bit ad less adventurous in what they, what they buy. Um, you know, if they don't, if they're going in, so you, you don't sort of, it's a bit hard to go into an online bookshop and say, I'm looking for something to read. What shall I start with? Because you don't get that much of a rich presentation and there's so much choice that you get a bit overwhelmed, right? Now, of course, we're all learning how to do our social media marketing and how to target our readers and how to reach out and create demand uh, for our books specifically in the communities that we serve. And if you can do that successfully, then online becomes a very efficient channel. So if you know what you want online, then it's fast, it's convenient, you can do it from your phone, the book gets delivered to you, wonderful. But um, the bookshop as a place to discover books and to introduce new books uh, is is really, um, it's difficult to replicate that experience online. And especially for fiction publishers and so on, you know, you need that kind of discovery. I, I go in, I'm going to read a novel. I feel like reading a science fiction novel, even if I know I want a particular genre, right? I'm going to browse. I'm going to look at the books in the bookshop. I'm going to pick some up, maybe flip through, read the blurbs, look at the cover design and all of that. Uh, a bit harder to do that in the online space. Now, all of those things I just said, look at the authors, read the blurbs, look at the cover design, all those things are metadata, right? So this is our new bookshelf. And it's not very exciting, right? So I searched for books on rock music in Singapore. Uh, I'll tell you why, because I'm just publishing a book on rock music in Singapore. It's lucky for me, it's the number one uh, uh, search result in Amazon.sg when I look for rock music in Singapore. Um, there it is, Sonic City, making rock music and urban life in Singapore. But still, that's not a very exciting, um, that's not a very exciting kind of result, right? Uh, it's very functional. But the, what information is there? The title, the author, publication date, price, information about delivery, and information whether the book's in stock. Gee, I guess it must be selling well. <laughs> I hope so, temporarily out of stock. Prob not necessarily the case. And of course, when you think about it, you know, as publishers, we're not really competing just with other books. I mean, the nice thing about publishing is that we cooperate. Well, you know, one individual book doesn't so often compete against another individual book. Not so much in trade publishing. In education publishing, it's quite different, of course. But um, if you look, step back and look big picture, we're kind of competing with all other uses of our leisure time, right? Like they asked Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, who he saw as his biggest competitor. And he didn't say HBO, he said computer games. Uh, because we're all competing for time of consumers, of readers, of learners. Uh, they have many different options. And, and now with everything mediated through the computer screen, even the uh, training and classes and meetings like this, then um, the competition for the time is even more. So I would say that our marketplace is now the Google search window as much as anything else. So here I uh, searched, I cheated a bit, I searched for the title of the book and I have a little window that opens up here, which gives me the, says there's a book by this name. And here it is. And does it link to my website? No, it links to Google Books page about the book. That's, that's Google. That's why probably we should be 
suing them for anti-competitive behavior. But at least my book, my website comes up first in the search results. And then you see the book on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and all other uh, retailers that we work with, uh, the book comes up here. If I search for rock music in Singapore, which is what I, what I searched for um, uh, here on the Amazon page, our book does come up in the Google results, but it comes up about 12th or, or 14th. Um, so it could be, uh, could be a bit higher. Before that, you get sort of gig guides and places to actually go hear live rock music in Singapore. So that's, you know, that kind of matches probably what most people who are searching for rock music in Singapore would be looking for. Um, but the point I'm making is that as our competition, our marketplace, if you will, is actually not just in the bookshop or in the online booksellers, it's actually out there in the internet. And so metadata is also super crucial for helping us to make a presence in that space, as well as in the dedicated book spaces. So again, if, we're the, if we can seamlessly uh, make it easier to tackle all of these arenas and get our information out there, that's what the goal here is. Um, I'll give you another example of, uh, you know, you say, well, you know, online is online, you know, bookshops are still bookshops. Uh, in the U.S., it hasn't quite happened here yet, or we don't, I don't know enough about how they work, there are bookshops in Singapore, but in the U.S., bookshops use something called Edelweiss to decide what to buy. It used to be that we get catalogs and they would get meetings from reps. Right, so you get the catalogs come in. These are all the books that are available to you as a bookshop. These, are, you know, these are all your accounts are sending you the catalogs, and maybe you get a visit from a sales rep who says, "Look, these are the th books that we think are going to be big. This is the publicity we're doing, and so on." That increasingly has uh, changed, and this Edelweiss system is how um, the book buyers in the bookshops make their decisions on what to buy. And so it also includes key metadata, um, cover of the book, title, author, publication dates, pricing, discounts, the kind of discount that in this case, our distributor is the University of Chicago Press. So the kind of discounts that are offered, the categories, what sort of book is this? Um, is it available in which markets? Pages, does it have photographs, size? status, so on. Um, there's more detailed information here. And, you know, frankly, we're still not as complete as we should be on providing this more detailed information. Much love means that somebody reviewed it on Edelweiss. So somebody went into Edelweiss, and, which is mostly book buyers and uh, book reviewers, but somebody's already said, hey, this is a good book, which makes me happy. It wasn't me. <laughs> and I don't think it was the author. Um, but here's other information, right? So information about the book. And this is quite interesting, comparable titles. So uh, what other books are similar to it uh, to help the bookshop kind of understand how it fits in? None of these are really going to help us sell the book, I'm afraid. But um, these, are, these are the titles that are comparable. So even for the bookshop, certainly in the big, bigger markets, uh, the way that you sell the book to get into the bookshop in the first place is through this kind of interface, which is an interface all of metadata. They will never see the book. Um, and libraries, you know, frankly, buy books the same way. Uh, academic libraries, certainly. Um, they will have an equivalent. There's a few different ones out there. Gobi, Yankee Book Peddler, you know, Gobi is the same one. Baker and Taylor has others that do this sort of job and the librarian says, okay, look, I'm buying books on Southeast Asian history and they will filter and then just show those books to the librarian and tick, 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 tick. And then of course the consumer also buys, uh, reads books even from the library. We read books in a similar interface. Uh, we go to the card catalog. National Library in Singapore, you don't even have to go to the library, right? You can go use the remote catalog, check it out, have it waiting for you. Uh, in your closest branch a couple days later. So just to kind of say this, um, you know, metadata is the, the space and universe of metadata is where we sell the books. And most of you, I think, compared to 2012, 
in 2020, you guys all know that. I mean, I heard it coming out of the, um, uh, coming out of the discussion. But uh, I thought it's worthwhile to look at all the cases, even right sales. Uh, Betty, this will resonate with you. This is how we usually sell rights to publishers overseas. We meet them at the Frankfurt Book Fair on the Singapore stand, and we talk to them about the books and we pitch them about our books. And um, that's me. Uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but you know, that's me up there. There's Betty selling away here. Um, uh, Marshall Cavendish, that's Leslie. Uh, Ethos Books, I mean, whoever was on the Singapore stand at the time is, is, is pitching hard. Um, so, but even this uh, high touch, personal relationship based way of selling has been replaced this year by the online Frankfurt Book Fair. And what is the rights catalog of the online Frankfurt Book Fair? It looks like this. And, you know, here we are again. Postage stamp book cover, metadata, subject, title, authors, blurb. Um, sorting it out, you can sort it out in different ways. Uh, you can search in lots of different ways. You can search by subject, by publisher, by language, by place. And this is how we have to sell our online books now. And when you go in to the page, um, this is what you see, lots of categories of metadata. So this is what, you know, gives us all headaches, all of this information. Can't we just fill it in in one go? Um, and uh, the answer is we can, of course, and Frankfurt does allow something called a bulk upload uh, so that you can export from your uh, metadata system and upload in one go and, as opposed to filling out hundreds or d dozens of these forms. <clears throat> so, in all of these situations, library buyers, um, book buyers uh, for shops, online selling, uh, uh, going to the library, you know, deciding what book to check out of the library, all of these, uh, the search is really important and discoverability is really important. And uh, once they found your book, what they're seeing is the metadata. So it's become even more important now. Any questions at this point? Uh, here I just do, do a little search, right? So uh, I sell up some books on Singapore history. And uh, it's important to me that when you search for Singapore history, you find my book, right? Uh, so you do. It's number second. It's the second one. I guess that's fair enough. <laughs> I don't mind being second to Lee Kuan Yew. Um, but I have more, you know, and I, and I hope they're down there. So uh, let's pause there for a second and we'll, we'll, t we'll talk a little bit more about what is metadata. So basically what I've been doing is making the case for why metadata is even more important and how uh, the, the, all of these interactions, which are so important to selling your book, increasingly they are interactions not with you as a publisher, as a salesperson, but with the book metadata. Uh, so any questions uh, at this point, just um, uh, can raise your hand or um, I'll, go to, I'll go to gallery view here if you want to raise your hand if any questions or in the chat uh, also. And just pause to stop talking for a second. <laughs> Okay, cool. So let's jump into um, let's jump into what is metadata. Oh, so um, the idea of a card catalog as a way to organize the library was something that started, as far as I I, I didn't do a lot of research on this, but it seemed to start in about 1870, maybe 1850s. Um, you know, the uh, U.S. started its Library of Congress. They started to build a national library. Um, I'm sure the French and the English had ones before, but this idea of capturing the key information on a card, 
that would then help you find the book uh, was really the, where you know, so much of our metadata or now our ideas about metadata got started. Um, and of course, these punch cards could later carry, da carry data actually in bits in them. And the punch card metaphor became, of course, a way to get data in and out of uh, computer systems early on. So the, the overlap between the, uh, Sean, that's why I wanted to mention the overlap between the IT and the book data information. But here we see, uh, here we see some basic metadata from an old card catalog. So name of the author, uh, birth and death, what kind of books, and what is actually going to be on the spine of the book, I think. Um, Sci-fi ZL, ZL for the Zelensky, the name of the author. Title, which edition is it? Is it a reprint, first edition, second edition? Where was it published? In Garden City, New York. By Doubleday, when? 1970. So all of these are different metadata fields. Uh, how long? 188 pages. Size of the book, 22 cm. Uh, Peter? Hi, sorry, this is Joshua here. Uh, would you mind sharing your screen? Because we're not seeing your slides. Uh, yeah, thank you for, I forgot to put share screen back on. Oh my goodness, thanks. Hang on. Bo -bo -bo, zoom, share screen. Thank you very much for the interruption. Um, okay, cool. So there we go. Sorry, I was going on, but there's what I'm talking about. Um, the old card catalog. Uh, you guys see it now? Give me a, give me a thumbs up. Yep, you do. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. So um, this, uh, how many of you ever used a card catalog, <laughs> by the way? <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to gallery view just to get a thumbs. Okay, I got one thumbs up. Thumbs up for anybody who actually used a card catalog. Okay, a few of us. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a bit of an artifact now. Okay, back to screen sharing. Uh, interestingly, there's a credit for the artist who did the cover. That's kind of an uh, important thing in science fiction, I guess. And uh, information about usage, that's really just for the library, but that's also metadata, right? Information about the book for the purpose of the library. Uh, publishers will have information that they don't share otherwise, but still is very important information about the book. And then um, some indexing uh, keys, how to index this book. So if I was, I, I heard about this book about Amber, Amber something, some ah, Amber Imaginary Place Fiction. I could, if I, there may be another card with that uh, under that uh, category. So metadata is basically uh, data about data, right? Meta, data about data. Metaphysics is knowledge about thinking about how physics works and, you know, that sort of data beyond and above physics. Metadata is data about data, in our case, data about books. And it includes data which is um, uh, very obvious uh, if you see the book, if you have the book, but it may also include data which is, and data which is very public, which publishers are desperate to share and get out there, but it may also include information which is private, which only the publisher uh, needs to know about. Yes, uh, this is where metadata was for the longest time. Uh, when we started using the ISBN system, which kind of got going in the late 60s, if I'm not wrong, um, you know, then we started to computerize and digitize uh, this metadata. And when libraries started to do computer systems about the same, computer catalogs about the same time. Um, but for a long time, publishers, I mean, this screenshot is actually the NUS Press, uh, our old ISBN log. So we had a folder <laughs> that where all the ISBNs that we were assigned by the National Library were kept, and we would tick them off as we assigned them to books. So that folder, you know, became a very important document. I remember working for another publishing company, helping them do their eBooks, and I said, "Okay, we've got 50 books that we're turning into eBooks. Where do we get the ISBNs?" And the editor said, "Oh, yeah, hang on a second." 
She got up from her desk, walked, follow, I followed her through the office to a storeroom, you know, you unlocked the storeroom, went into a thing behind the filing cabinet, pulled out a sheet of paper like this as well, which was the paper register of the uh, ISBNs. So the ISBN is a really important uh, piece of metadata because it's what the industry came up with uh, as the sort of key field as the master um, key to uh, the, all the information about a book. So when you're building databases, you usually have one master key, which uh, is the record that you use to keep track of all the information, is the field you use to keep track of all the records, the single field which is most reliable. You can't use the title because you might have a paperback and an EPUB and a PB, PDF and a uh, addition, there might be books that have very similar titles and so on. So the ISBN is the number, then it can be turned into a barcode, then it can be used in scanning systems and so on. So industry sorted that out uh, some time back. Um, and now, of course, it's become even more important uh, as a way to tie together all of these different systems that we have. Here's a book cover of a book we're just publishing, have it just about going to market. Uh, Maybe um, can you guys tell me or um, just kind of uh, think to yourself what metadata you see here? Uh, I'm going to, yeah, just spend two minutes looking at that and sort of uh, write down or note uh, what, I hope that's not too small for you to see on your screen, what kind of um, what kind of metadata you see there. And um, I'll stop the share and come back to gallery. So uh, can you guys just type in the chat uh, what sort of metadata you saw on that cover? Okay, let me go. Uh, so thanks everybody. I think we spotted most of it. Um, let me just share it again. So we've got the title, title, we've got the authors, we've got the author's photograph. We've got the author's photograph on the cover too, <laughs> some years ago. Author bios, 
Okay. Uh, we have the imprint here, Ridge Books Singapore, um, which is not exactly the same as the publisher. Um, the imprint, a publisher might have different imprints. And in our case, NUS Press uses the Ridge Books imprint to signal that it's a trade book, that it's not a scholarly book. Uh, I'm not sure if our signaling is very good. You can give me your, your thoughts on that uh, separately, but that's, uh, that's kind of why we have a separate imprint. And then these quotes here um, from various people are uh, what we call endorsements um, or reviews, extracts from published reviews. There can be different types, right? These are what we would call pre-publication endorsements. So we sent the book out in manuscript or in proofs to various people and ask them to read the book and give us their comments. Um, but, you know, once we do the paperback edition, you know, touch wood, uh, then maybe we would be able to quote a review, uh, a post-publication review that appeared in a newspaper, magazine, or journal. Um, now, this bit here, uh, actually both the italic red part and the um, uh, text, uh, goes by many different names. And so one of the things that you will find when you get more into the metadata systems is that you settle on a kind of standard vocabulary. So you will learn what, um, you know, we do, there is some sort of common vocabulary. So I've heard this called um, synopsis. Chloe called it synopsis. A lot of people will say, oh, this is the blurb. Um, it could be the description. Uh, it could be the sales pitch. Uh, you could call it lots of different things. In the world of metadata, it would generally be called the main description or possibly the short description. Or if you want to be, if you had a longer one, this would be the, sh you know, might be the short version, it might be the long version. But anyway, it's the main one for us. That's the main one that we'll use most widely. And then, you know, in some cases, people, marketing will put extra effort in and they'll say, well, the blurb that you have when you have the book in your hand, it does a kind of different job uh, from the blurb that you're, uh, that when you're reading it online, right? And I, I think that's, that's quite important. I mean, when you have the book in your hand, you're already halfway to buying it, right? I mean, you, you, at least the possibility is there, uh, is, mu is much stronger. And so the blurb just kind of pushes you over, the description just kind of pushes you over the edge. Um, but when you're online or when you're a librarian or you're you know, going to Amazon, you don't have the physical book to sort of give you all those other cues. So especially for an ebook, for example, you know, maybe that text is a little bit different. Uh, maybe for the ebook version, you stress uh, some other part of the text. So you can have different descriptions for different purposes and the different and the Onyx standard, uh, which is the, the main system for describing book metadata, which we'll come to a bit later, allows different categories of description. Um, but we'll call it, we'll call it main, um, we'll call it main description for now. Um, and blurb is a, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but the, the, the language around the, the word blurb is a bit confusing. So, um, we try to, when we ask somebody to write a blurb, usually we mean to write something like this. So a, a kind of short, snappy endorsement. Uh, if an author says, I've been asked to blurb a book, that means they've been asked to write something like this. And then this will just call the description. But I, but you know, the, the, the way people use the language is a bit different uh, in practice. So there's your number one source of metadata uh, that you've already got, that you've already had to gather, that you've already put a lot of thought and effort into, and you put it on the book cover. So you've got it. It's there. Um, uh, where else is it? It's in, how many of you use uh, ABIs, Advanced Book Information Sheets, or they have different names as well. So this is often what you would send out before publication. Um, uh, and it would have pricing information, date of publication, um, here's something that uh, a lot of um, distributors overseas ask for, key selling points. So what are the three main points that 
are, are interesting about this book, so on. So those of you who create these, who use these, who create flyers, whether they're for the trade or whether they're to send out in direct mail to consumers or book buyers or librarians or teachers, again, this is all the metadata, the information about the book that you're putting together. So the boring stuff, the necessary stuff. Um, this session, because it's the first one, I'm not gonna go through all the fields because there are a lot of them and we're still trying to determine what are, is gonna be our minimum set for uh, Singapore for the book data system that SBPA is building. But almost anything that you can think of about a book can be the metadata. And in today's world, the metadata is almost more important than the book itself. Ha, ha, ha. So for example, if you want to, um, are you guys seeing the screen again? I'm going to check each time. Okay, here we go to share the screen. If you want to share your ebook on the National Library Board, this is the, uh, your ebook onto the OverDrive platform. There are other platforms, but OverDrive is the main one for English books anyway. Uh, if you want to get your book onto that, you've got to give them this metadata. So let's just look at some of these fields. The required title, the file name, because it's an e-book so that there's a file and you've got to make sure the name of it is clear. Uh, maybe you're giving one EPUB and one PDF. Creator name, creator role. Okay, so Wang Gongwu is the author. Margaret Wong is the co-author, contributor, maybe. Um, editor, photographer, designer, many, many different, translator many, many different roles, contributors. You can have multiple contributors. The publisher, the retail standard retail price, the library standard, rec I think SRP's recommended price, the library standard recommended price, in which currency? <laughs> so don't tell somebody your book costs $32 and they think you mean US and you're talking same. Um, when it is available on sale date, what language is it in? Geo rights. So geo rights are the territorial rights. In what right, in what countries do you have the right to sell this book? Because many of us will only have the right to sell a book in certain countries, or we will give our distributor the right to sell the book in certain countries. This is one of the toughest areas because there are what 172 countries and territories around the world uh, and getting that information correct and uh, making, letting systems read it properly is sometimes a challenge. Short description, okay? So if I'm sending this book off, I'd probably just take my main description and put it into short description. Uh, and cover file name. So that image of the cover, I also need a name for the JPEG or PNG file with that. So that is required, required if available, if the book has a subtitle, if it has an ISBN, most of us will have the ISBNs, UPC or catalog ID, publication date. Then here, this one is what we're going to dig into a little bit more subject. So what is your book about? Uh, and BSAC and BIC are two systems for coming up with your book subject. Are you offering this book? And now here's information which is specific to the OverDrive platform. Are you offering this book to libraries or are you offering it to retailers only? So you, you, you publisher decides, you tell OverDrive, OverDrive decides how to sell your book and where to display your book on the basis of this. Are you making your book available DRM free so that anyone can copy it? Uh, or are you uh, having some kind of technical measure to make sure that the book isn't copied? This again is information that they need to get that book out into their system. Now, most people will need most of these things, but not everyone needs this information, for example. So different vendors and different channels will need different material. Um, first edition, reprint, you know, uh, book buyers want to know if you're just keep reintroducing the same title over and over again every year. Oh, I have a new book. <laughs> they want to know that. No, there's not the first edition. Um, imprint, library ISBN. Some people have two editions, a library edition and a, a trade edition. 
Keywords. So this will all go into helping the search engine. Reviews. Uh, so Overdrive doesn't seem to care about my endorsements, my blurbs, you know, my pre-publication endorsements. They don't have a space for me to put those in. Um, so if I want those to appear on Overdrive's catalog, I'm going to have to cram them into short description. They might reject it. But if I have reviews, I can put them in and I can update the metadata. So what's the source? Asian Review of Books, Straits Times, whatever, and the quote and content. Other formats. So is this book available in hardback, paperback, et cetera? Uh, and the creator's bio. So that's a kind of just one example of a minimum set of metadata. Um, let's, um, it's 10.05. Let's take a, a short break there, if that's okay with you. Um, come back in five minutes. Um, just stretch our legs and um, uh, get a drink of water or something and, and come back in a couple minutes. Is that okay? Um, I'm going to take a break anyway, so I encourage you to, and I'll see you back in uh, at 1010. Thanks.
Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Hope you're, uh, I had to get a, another cup of coffee. Okay, let me go back to um, sharing the screen and continue to dig into just that. What I wanted to do is rather than go through all of the different fields, give you a sense of the sorts of different fields that um, people are asking for, and then to just dig into a few and the way they're used in uh, our system uh, to, to give you an idea of, of uh, how you might be able to approach this in your own settings. So this is where we were with the metadata that you need if you want to send your books to OverDrive to get into National Library Awards ebook program. Um, if any of you are not in that, it's really, I mean, the pandemic has really driven a big increase in usage uh, of ebooks. So now I think the last quote is there up to, Saad Ali, what was it, four and a half million or six million uh, pace to do loans per year? So uh, that's pretty significant. And they are buying multiple copies. I mean, um, they're buying more copies of ebooks than there are of print books for if you have a new book that's come out this year that there's demand for, they will, in some, in, certainly in the case of NUS Press, we're finding that they will buy more eBooks than they will print books of a single title. So, uh, so it's pretty interesting channel, uh, especially if you price your books as library, for library prices rather than consumer prices, but that's another subject for another day. Um, we haven't talked about metadata much in Singapore. I mean, one, one thing I, I'll hear a lot is that, you know, um, foreign publishers will be, you know, have, have been dealing with e metadata and systems for handling metadata for a long time. But we haven't, and that's really because we're, you know, our industry and our supply chain is pretty small and it hasn't been so s tightly managed. I mean, the investment to create a system to send metadata back and forth and so on among all the players in the supply chain, there's some cost to that, right? And so far we haven't needed it. Our retailers have said, oh, just you know, send us the book, right? <laughs> or send us an ABI two months in advance now. But, um, and our overseas distributors haven't needed it so much. Demand has been low. It's a few books at a time, not to worry about. So they haven't demanded that we give them that ebook data or that data metadata systematically. Uh, the result is that often our data will get scrambled. So this was one of the things that really uh, got me upset when I joined NUS Press uh, last round eight years ago, is I would search for our books and I'd find that the information would be wrong, scrambled. 
And that's because we weren't sending out information. We weren't sending out information um, systematically. We weren't sending it out consistently and in a way that could be then sent on to the other partners uh, very easily. So if you don't send it out properly, and if you just say, well, they're not, they're not asking me for it, so I don't need to, maybe I don't need to give it, the risk is that they will um, get your information in different ways and it will get scrambled and it won't be the best information about your books. So we didn't really talk about it much. We didn't it need it. Publishing, local publishing wasn't maybe so big that, you know, your book might get lost. But of course, now things have changed. Ebook selling requires this. So a lot of you are saying, you know, that's why we have a healthy representation of ebook teams in this call. Uh, the online venues, as I took the first half hour to show you, are becoming more and more important, even for the offline selling. So uh, we didn't talk about it much. We started talking about it in 2012 maybe and increased it. Um, and now it's a, pain, it's a pain point. So here, I think this will resonate with some of you. Let me share this screen again. Um, the horrible spreadsheet problem. So you've signed on a new vendor, or in this case, you've decided to upload your titles to a rights catalog that operated by the Frankfurt Book Fair. And they say, give us the data in this format, and they send you a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet isn't just, you know, six columns. It goes all the way to AK. <laughs> or some of them I've seen I'll go all the way to C, CR, you know. Boom. Um, multiple, multiple columns out. Uh, so it's not easy to even see it on one screen. Uh, and it's a real pain to type it all in. And guess what? They might want information in certain kinds of codes. They might want the big code, which is one of the things we'll, we'll dig into. So the subject matter, they don't want just your idea of what subject is. Oh, it's a biography. It's about sports. You know, no, they want a standard code that the book trade uses uh, so that they can categorize all the books in a systematic way. So um, yes, you can do this by cutting and pasting from a Word doc or even your own spreadsheet into this spreadsheet, but it's much, much easier if you have a system that can output this spreadsheet. It's still a quite a bit of work because you have to tell your system, this is the data I need and maybe you even need to arrange it in the order uh, that Frankfurt, in this case, wants it, right? So there's a bit of work involved in that. But once you do that, punch, out it comes, upload, and done. Well, those of you who do it know there's always something that goes wrong. You know, the pricing data got the wrong currency or something. But anyway, it saves a lot of work for sure to be able to do that. So this is the kind of form that many of us are now used to sharing our metadata in. These spreadsheets that give us the metadata type and that give us some helpful hints often about how they, what form they want the data in. Uh, and then we send it. Author biography is here. Format is here. Something we didn't uh, talk about as metadata. Endorsements and reviews. So Frankfurt is a bit more understanding than um, Overdrive, they're willing to have endorsements, blurbs, as well as published reviews. Um, number of pages, is it part of a series? Quite important for education, quite important for genre, uh, fiction, for example. First edition, second edition, so you see NUS Press had to say, oh, no, that's the second edition. Uh, original language, if it's a translation, that's of quite great interest when you're trading rights. Copyright year, publication place, there you go, description. So lots of spreadsheets. Once you get into this world, lots of spreadsheets. So how can we, how can we make life different? And, and like we said, the, the ebook, there's even more because a lot of that information actually has to go inside the ebook file. Uh, the ebook standard is such that you can actually, they said, well, why not just put that metadata inside the file so that the reading system can pull it out and display it to the reader? Uh, 
Uh, so it's a slightly different approach that is taken with the EPUB standard. Like I said, if you don't create it and if you don't control it, somebody else will do it for you and they will introduce mistakes and not, um, and not represent your book in the best possible way. You're the one who knows your book best. Um, other people might know their market best, so you should listen to them when they, when they give you feedback on your metadata, but you don't want them to write it for you. And categories are key, and that's the one that I thought we should, on this session, dig into a little bit more. So categories. Well, you know about categories, right? You walk into the library and you go for the section of the kind of books you like. Um, you go into a bookshop and you go to the section for the kind of books you're interested in. I'm interested in history. I'm interested in literature. I'm interested in crime fiction. I'm interested in fantasy, um, whatever it might be. So kind of what happened, I guess, is that uh, publishers had a great interest in telling bookshops what, you know, what sort of category this book fit into, but bookshops all had different ways of categorizing the books. So the industry got together with the bookshops and they came up with these uh, in the US and the UK at least and came up with these standards. Uh, the book industry uh, study group came up with, um, um, with BISAC, they call it, BSAC, BISAC, I've heard both. And that's uh, subject, subject headings. And the UK um, came up with BIC, Book Industry Council, maybe, anyway. A, slight, a slightly different system of categories. Mostly these are subject categories, but they're not subject categories like a library catalog. They're subject categories according to what book buyers want. So fiction will have, you know, different categories according to genre of fiction, whereas libraries might not do that, right? They might just put all fiction together by author. Um, and, you know, so it's not a kind of scientific method. It's a commercial method of, uh, of dividing the books up. And one of the things we find when we try to sell our books from Singapore into this system is that the categories for nonfiction books say about Southeast Asia are not very well developed, right? I mean, there's like Asia. <laughs> and when you go to a bookshop in the UK, that's what you'll find, right? So history, Asia, <laughs> and all of Asia will be in one shelf. And then, you know, the UK will have 20 shelves and Europe will have 10 and so on. The fact of life, right? This is commercially driven. But still, uh, in our own bookshops, maybe we need something a bit more elaborate. Maybe we want Singapore history, Malaysian history, Indonesian history. In fact, if you go to Kinakunia, you get that. Uh, our education system will have different requirements, right? So if you're looking for assessment books or supplementary books, you need them organized by course, and we have our own ways of doing that. So we do need a bit of our own system. And guess what? We're not alone in the world. Um, every country needs its own system. So in recent years, there's been a new system developed called Thema. And Thema is meant to be more flexible and to allow, um, it allows a whole group of other categories, including geographical listing. So you can take history and then you can add on geographies to it, Singapore history, Malaysian history, and so on. Or you, can, um, and, or you can subdivide and create new categories for your own, re, uh, own needs more easily. Um, but any of you who are sending data to these systems, so right now our Singapore bookshops do this on their own, I guess. They don't necessarily ask us. Um, if we have BIC or, BI, uh, or BSAC data, they will use it uh, to decide their categories. But these are pretty powerful, you know, some, depending on the category, they may not even consider your book. If, you, if it's a category that they are not interested in, they won't even consider it. So you, you do have to uh, understand how your book is being categorized. And the best way to do that is to do your own categorization. I'm constantly quarreling, but we publish environmental history. 
Okay, so books about the history of a place, but not just strictly speaking the history of the people uh, and the government and the, you know, all that stuff, but about nature. How did nature change? How did the environment change? How did animals change? So, so we have these books. Uh, they, when we send them to bookshops, they mostly put them in the nature section. Okay, fair enough. But we think they should also, they really actually are more history than they are about birds, right? They just happen to be the history of the environment, the humans and the environment together. So then we go to the bookshop and say, oh, no, can't you put them in history, right? So this is the kind of, uh, of course, the bookshop has the final decision, but, um, you know, to give, to have input on that decision as a publisher, to understand where the audience is, you understand that better than they do. <clears throat> so in order to give them the right clues and to give them the right starting point, you need to get your categories right. Uh, you may also have your own categories that you use for uh, your own website, for example. So you, uh, certainly NUS Press does, we organize our website according to our own kind of categories. We try to match them onto other categories, but they'll be slightly different, right? So you need to categorize, you need to understand how your books would be seen in BIC and BISAC. Um, we hope to develop uh, over the course of the next year, a categorization system for Singapore that our retailers will also find useful, that our libraries will find useful, and that you will find useful as publishers. So that's one part of the book data project that we're, we're working on. Um, and uh, it's also uh, super important for discoverability and searchability out in the web. So let's dig in, let's come back to share the screen and dig in to some of that a little bit more. Um, so here you go, uh, you know, these are sort of the top, I'm sorry, we've gone backwards. These are kind of the top level categories you see on both sides. But of course, uh, precision is good in categories. If you can be more specific and more precise about what your book is about, probably you're doing a better job of describing it. So what I wanted to do was actually uh, seek your help in um, adding some metadata to a title uh, that you've seen already, the Wang Gangwu memoir in our system. We haven't added, actually we did, I took them out, I'll put them back in, uh, the categories uh, for that title. And the other area to look at I wanna show you is the sales rights information. So where is this book available? Um, and so I'll show you how we do it on the NUS press system. This is a system that we, um, we rent we use it as a software as a service from a company called Styson. I don't owe them any um, sales pitch, I guess, but uh, the, I can tell you that they offer, you can get started for free um, if you are interested to check it out. You can at least have a look and, and um, see how it works for you. Um, and um, yeah, if there's some interest then at SBPA level, we can also see about, um, they've made an offer to us to, be a kind of reseller at a very advantageous price uh, to our members. So that's something that we'll be finding out from you if you have appetite or interest for such a system. So I'm going uh, uh, to share, a, I'm going to stop the share now. I'm going to share a different screen and show you that system. Uh, just give me some feedback to make sure it's working. It's, um, it's pretty scary. And um, yeah, it's pretty scary. So don't be too frightened at first glance. Um, bit of a learning curve, but once you get over that, it's super useful. So let me just make sure I've got it set up on my browser and let me bring you in. And I'm just looking at the chat. Sorry, I got a little bit um, behind on that. I do see um, a couple questions, which may, maybe I'll address before we dig into the system. So difference between imprint and publisher. Did I cover that? I mean, I think, you know, NUS Press is just one example, publishes uh, academic books, but we also publish books which are much less academic that are more for the general reader. So to distinguish those two books, we use two different imprints. Ridge books, you know, Kent Ridge, NUS Kent Ridge. Um, and uh, 
and U.S. Press for the academic books. And you'll find many publishers do that too. They might have one imprint that signals this is for middle grade. They might have an imprint that they use for their graphic novels as opposed to their others. They might have one imprint for textbooks and another imprint for supplementary books or assessment books, just so that to make super clear to, it's a branding issue basically, to make super clear to, to readers that it's different. But the publisher is you know, the one financially and legally responsible for the book. Uh, we're the one who signs the contract with the distributor. So the distributor needs to know, everybody needs to know who's the pub, who gets paid right? Uh, that's the publisher, but the imprint, the branding could be different. Are reviews, endorsements, and considered metadata? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, as we've talked about, and sometimes they're lumped together, like Frankfurt lumped them together. Uh, sometimes they're separated, and, you know, somebody wants only one or the other. A good metadata system will allow you to um, have, allow you to keep the distinction between the pre-publication endorsement and the post-publication review, uh, but sometimes you will want to send them out together. So your system also has to lump them together and separate them depending on the use. Ah, this is where it starts to get uh, kind of tricky. But anyway, let's, let's, uh, let me show you our system and uh, dig in. Wish me luck. Share screen, Google Chrome, share. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? Is there a, I've got a green outline around it. So just give me a thumbs up if you see it, Xingwei. I've got you, you're on my window there. Okay, super. So uh, this is our system from Stison and it lists our books. And we have um, 784 records in the system as of now. Um, there are a few books that we never got around to putting in. We probably should and so on but let's look at one title. So um, I'm gonna search for, I'm gonna search for home is where we are. Oh yeah, it wants me to, I was afraid of that. It wants me to log in again, um, hang on. Can you see my password if I type it in? No. Okay, so I'm re-logged into the system. It, you know, most of these systems will give you uh, different levels of access for different users. I'm an admin administrator. You can see that up there once I'm uh, keyed in. Um, so that's just, you know, so you can manage who has access to what information, mostly to keep people from making mistakes. So let's zoom into our title, uh, Home is Where We Are. Never do a live demo. <laughs> okay. So if you look at all of these tabs across the top, these are all different categories of metadata that we could be putting in here. In, uh, title information, information about the contributor, information about the different forms the book might be in, paperback, hardback, PDF, EPUB, ISBN information, information about the publication, who's the publisher, is it part of a set? So, you know, metadata gets a bit complicated if you have uh, 10 books in a, in a set, uh, maybe language textbooks or something, right? Subject, which is the one we'll dig into. What, what is your book about? Price, so you can have different prices in different currencies, different prices for different markets, different prices for different formats. The rights, where is this book able to be sold? Uh, in which languages, in which territories? Other, there's lots of good stuff in other. <laughs> uh, marketing, so marketing information, where do you keep information about the marketing of the book? Related, uh, related to marketing, I think. Media related to the book, so that can be the book covers, it can be images that are in the book that you wanna use for marketing purposes. It can be social media cards that you've developed. All of that media that you use, it could be uh, PDFs of the book that you send to samples. You can keep all of that stuff in here together. Amazon is so important that they have a special category that looks at how your book, the data that Amazon uses for your book. Um, what is the table of contents, the chapters? 
um, what is information specific to different channels, contacts related to the book. Maybe you have a publicist who's helping you, something like that. Uh, and SEO, you guys know what SEO is, right? Um, search engine optimization. So this would be information to help you sell the book overseas. And tags. Tags are categories that you can use for your own purposes. Um, you could put the name of the editor for certain books so you can track performance by editor. I know a lot of publishing companies do that. End of the year, hey, editor one, your book sold better than editors twos, you know. Um, so tags can be used for internal information as well as uh, keywords for external information. So here we are at title and uh, pretty simple for us in this case, um, full title. Prefix would be, you know, if it started with a uh or a the, so you just want to tell people alphabetized by the, the word after the prefix. Subtitle, in many cases we have a subtitle language. ISTC is the International Standard Text. C, text. Oh. <laughs> anyway, it's, um, uh, it's kind of like an ISBN, but for the work itself. So if you have, an, if you have a book in, and you have it in hardback, paperback, EPUB, and PDF, you, the idea is that we have one number for the work itself. And then we have ISBNs for the different forms. It hasn't been widely adopted, but it's kind of slowly growing. So anyway, these are, let's, let's zoom into subject and the BIC and the BSAC categories that we looked at. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm showing you our system on this is because they've done a nice job of integrating Thema with BIC and BSAC. So Thema is the next level of development of category system, and it um, maps on to BIC and BSAC. So if you get your Thema right, then you can, um, then it'll automatically give you your BIC and BSAC codes. So Home is Where We Are is a memoir by uh, Professor Wang Gongwu. It's, a, it's, um, it's really a memoir, so it's kind of the main category is going to be pretty easy. We just have to find it. But it's also a little bit about history. It's a little bit about education. So maybe there's another category that, that we would add to. If you were interested in the development of uh, higher education in Malaysia and Singapore, you'd, you'd have to read this book. So maybe there's a category about you know, history of education or something. I, I don't even know. I'd like it if there was. So I'm going to look. I, actually, I don't literally know the answer to that question. So um, here we go. We're going to go into the Thema categories and try to find the right categories for this book. So we're going to navigate through the Thema categories. Um, and as we said, we have qualifiers about place. We'll come to those later. We have language qualifiers, time period, educational purpose, interest, style. So Thema gives us the ability to add categories for all of these things, which is really useful, which BIC and BSAC didn't have. BIC and BSAC only had subjects. So here are our high-level subjects in Thema. Okay. Are you guys seeing that? All good? Um, so the arts, language and linguistics, biography, literature, literary studies, fiction, and related. What's related to fiction? Uh, reference, social science, law, medicine, etc. So not easy. Graphic, you'll notice that graphic novels, comics get their own category. And kids books, Teenage and educational gets its own category as well. This is designed, again, I repeat, this is designed mostly for bookshops, but then actually now for all kinds of retail, uh, online retail as well. So what's our book again? Uh, Home is where we are, uh, Wang Gungwu. So it's a biography, it's a memoir. So can we find it here under biography? Biography and nonfiction prose. So yeah, literature, classical text, poetry, all of that was living under that high level category. So, you know, I could have one mistake that uh, my team makes a lot, uh, which we spend a lot of time talking about, is you just take the first one that looks right. You take the high level category. So you say, okay, it's a biography, I'm gonna just click biography. So there it is. My Thema code is biography. 
literature and literary studies, but that's not actually very helpful. Trash that, get rid of that. I want to remove that though, because it's too high level. Because once we get in there, we realize that um, navigate. Sorry, Peter. Yeah. We can't see the we can't categories. See, you can't see the pop-up, is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's try to share. I think I have to share the pop-up. Thank you for pointing that out. Don't we just love Zoom? Okay, can you see the pop-up now? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Said Ali. Sorry about that, guys. So, um, gosh, I'll try to navigate between the pop-up and the window, but don't hesitate to interrupt me if I get it wrong. So here, when I started to, when I clicked on, you know, choose my theme of code, I got this pop-up window, and that gives me these place qualifiers, language qualifiers, time period, educational purpose, but also then the subjects. And so biography and literary studies, but I'm not going to choose that because there's liter all of literature is inside that category. I need to be more specific. So I zoom down and I see, oh yeah, good thing I didn't check that because there's ancient poetry, etc. I'm going to go for biography and nonfiction prose. Click on that. And this is what I get. General biographies, memoirs, that's what I want probably, the diaries, letters and journals, etc. Animal life stories, I don't know what that is. Uh, life of animals, I guess. Famous, famous resources or something. Um, literary essays, reportage, etc. So you see there's lots of possibilities here. Let's just dig into biography for a second and see what other categories we have for biography. Oh, a lot, actually. Autobiography, different kinds of biographies. So, uh, you know, it's growing in Singapore, uh, as a as a category, some of our best sellers are biographies or autobiographies or memoirs, um, but you see it's quite mature in other markets. So you'll have biographies of Princess Diana, kind of thing, adventures and explorers. Okay, so we're going to go up. I wonder if we should put autobiography, but I'm going to. Oh, that's a actually lot question in my mind, real question in my mind, but I'm going to put memoirs anyway. Okay, and. The, um, that window has closed now. Okay, fair enough. Um, and I'll come back to the main window. And there you are. Memoirs is now there. And I'm going to add a few more codes. So let's add a couple more. So now I have to do a new share for the window, share for the window. Okay, looks good. And um, I'm gonna navigate through the categories rather than just choose the ones that I used last time. I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna go back up. I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna do the autobiography. What's the difference between a memoir and an autobiography? I'm not sure I know. Um, does anybody, <laughs> anybody know? So these are the kinds of questions you find yourself asking uh, yourself. <laughs> I'm gonna click on autobiography general, sorry. There we go, so we've got two. We've got memoirs, which I'll make the main one, and autobiography second. I'm gonna add another theme of code to say that the book is mostly about Singapore and Malaysia. Um, so that, is under place qualifiers, Asia, Southeast Asia, Malaysia. I can go further if I want, like if it was about KL or Malacca or Penang or Sarawak or Sabah, but no, I, it's about you know Malaysia, higher education, politics in Malaysia in the 1960s, and Singapore. Um, so I'm going to add Malaysia, and there you see it. And I'm going to add Singapore. I guess you uh, there it is already. It was already on my shortcuts. So 
There are my FEMA codes. I've told everybody that it's a memoir. It's also kind of an autobiography. And uh, it's about Malaysia and Singapore. I'm going to look and see if I can add something to do with education or the history of education or higher education. So I'm going to see if there's a... Oh, sorry. Let me share that with you guys. Share you the pop-up. Higher education. So again, the system is set up to uh, allow you to search for these categories. And then here's the downside of a system like FEMA. So I find, oh yeah, for higher education, but this is a category that's only used in Mexico. So the Mexican publishers have decided that they wanted a special category to say, I think this book is used in higher education. But there's no point me putting that on because that's a category they only use in Mexico. So searching for higher education didn't really help. Um, let me try maybe history of education. Huh, there we go, history of education. So I'm gonna click that as well. Your sharing stopped because my window closed and I'll come back to the system. And there you go. So I've spent a little bit of time, but it's time that's um, uh, well spent to categorize the book. Now, if you're very well organized as a publisher, when an editor proposes a book in the first place, they will already be thinking about the category because they'll be wanting to tell marketing and sales how to sell the book. And knowing what category it is, is the first step of thinking about how you're gonna sell the book and how well it's gonna do. So memoirs do pretty well. Uh, memoirs of people who are you know, interesting uh, in Singapore do pretty well still. There's not quite a glut on the market. So I, you know, I did have to persuade people, but uh, this choice of metadata can be done very early on. And in many publishers is done right at the start. Uh, okay, so I've got my FEMA codes. Now I want my BIC and BISAC codes. So I'm mapping it and there you go. Um, so the system has given me the codes for BIC. It's a memoir, it's an autobiography, it's history of education, Malaysia and Singapore. Well, they just, so BIC and FEMA are obviously very closely related. Um, BISAC's a little bit different. So it's gone into biography and autobiography, personal memoirs, biography and autobiography general. Yeah, I think no harm in having that as well uh, for those people who don't maybe look at that level of detail and then education history. Yeah, I think that's correct. Um, there are other categories here that you can use. You can put the, the LOC number, the Dewey decimal number, if you've got these numbers from your librarian friends. Uh, if you're selling books mostly into library markets, you probably want to put that information there. We don't use it at the moment at NUS Press. Probably we should. Um, and subjects. So this, this, these are the subjects we use in our website. So memoirs and the themes we call the geographies. So Singapore and Malaysia update. Don't tell me my work was wasted, as I said. Sometimes they, uh, it's the middle of the, it's early in the morning for them. Sometimes they were uh, doing their maintenance on the system because they're in the UK during our peak hours in Singapore. And, and this kind of thing can happen. So we mostly try to do our Styson updates in the afternoon. Mm. Okay, there it is. So I'm going to go off share, come back to gallery view. Any questions uh, about categories? How many uh, codes can you add to one book? I've not seen the limit yet. The limit is in, uh, so at least Dyson, as far as I know, doesn't have a limit to how many you can add, or I haven't reached the limit yet. I don't think we've ever done more than six or seven. But uh, the point is that the systems that you're sending the data to may uh, usually have a limit. And um, 
Some, but some people only want to know one category because they're only using one category. Some people might want to know three categories, but I've seen a lot that will limit you to three. Um, and with BIC and BISAC, because you only had subject category, that made sense. With thema, where you might have a geographical category or a time period category, um, this book is about the 1960s. This book is about the uh, year 2020. They probably will allow more. Can the system generate Dewey or LLC codes? Uh, no, not this system, uh, because that's a decision which usually the librarians, well, li uh, library suppliers may say something different. Um, it's, that's a something, yeah, as far as I know, no, because the librarians tend to want to do that themselves or they want to, maybe they subcontract the categorization, the cataloging out to a vendor, but they still kind of want to control it. So traditionally the Dewey or Library of Congress codes are, um, it's under the control of the libraries, not the publishers. That's why we send, uh, that's one of the reasons we send the books to the libraries for um, uh, library cataloging information, right? Which we then put in our contents page because they're the ones who get to make the choice. By the way, you can, and we, we have argued with them. So sometimes we find the library gets it wrong. And this is more, usually it's for more academic books where, you know, the exact kind of genre of argument or field being used is a little bit hard to grasp if you're not a specialist. So we have gone back to the to Singapore National Library and said, no, can you consider categorizing it in this way? It doesn't happen very often, but it happens from time to time. Any other questions about subjects? Okay, um, I was gonna go on and show you rights. Um, I guess I'll do that, I'll show it to you. It's a little bit boring, I know, to see somebody going through something that you can't you know, see and touch yourself, but um, let me do that. I'll show you one more uh, category of this. And then if you want to look at something else uh, afterwards, just let me know. So we're sharing now, that's our categories. Um, and now let's look at rights. So you see, I've only got, right now we only have a hardback edition. We haven't, our, our EPUB and our PDF editions will come um, four to six months later. So we only have the hardback in the system at the moment. We should get the other ones in sooner rather than later, actually. Um, but let's look at sales rights. So it's a little bit complicated because you have different maps, or it can be simple. Sales rights with exclusive rights in the spe specified countries or territories. For this book, it's pretty easy. World. That's all I need to do. So we and U.S. Press have the exclusive right uh, as the publisher to sell the book all around the world. So that one is kind of simple. Update, done. Of course, we subcontract that right to our distributors, right? But that's not meant to be handled here. That just says this book can be sold by this publisher uh, in, uh, around the world. But uh, there may be other books which I've uh, purchased uh, say, Asian rights for. And in that case, I might need to change this. So I might say, I have exclusive rights to sell this in ASEAN X Philippines, for example. Or Now, these categories are categories that I set up because I often, if I buy a book from a Philippines publisher, which I sometimes do, um, I can sell it in ASEAN, but not in the Philippines. And then, um, then I can also sell it around the rest of the world. So let's say I buy a book from a Philippines publisher. They have the Philippines market. I have the rest of the world. So how would I set up those rights? 
So first I'll say ASEAN X Philippines, and then I'll say rest of the world. Or maybe I could do it, I would say, can I do this? World, and then I'll say not for sale in specified countries because publisher does not, can you see that? Publisher does not hold rights in these countries or territories. And then here I have to use territory or country. I use country Philippines. Philippines. And I'm not using territory, so I'm just to make sure. So that's probably a better way to say it. I have world rights except Philippines. So that's rights. And you can pick out you know, all the countries. Um, it sometimes gets a bit complicated if you're, you know, depending on your deal and uh, how you've prepared your own system. So like I said, these territories here, I actually created them myself because we sometimes do our rights deals in this manner. So Pacific Australasia for me means Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Island countries. Sometimes I get those right, sometimes I don't. Um, oops, sorry. So there you go. I'm going to trash that now because actually I have world rights for this one. Exclusive rights in world. We're talking about home is not here. Uh, home is where we are. Yeah, update. So that's a little window on the rights. Um, pricing and who are your distributors and all of that stuff is done under price. Um, if as you see under rights, there's actually a whole nother set of sub tabs. You can keep your contracts there. You can have different options. You can have restrictions on eBooks. Maybe you can sell it all around the world, but the eBook version you can't sell in one country. And then you can also in such a system, keep track of the PL of the book as well, uh, tied to the different sales rights. Uh, but that's not something, we're not actually using those functions at the moment. So uh, I think that's one important thing to know about a title management system. It's more than just specific to this vendor. Um, that it can then integrate with other systems that you need. But the title management is really the key. It's really the, the data that strings across. So what are some of the other systems you need? Well, you have an account system for tracking your sales, but it would be nice to have that sales information tied to the title so that you could analyze by subject, you could analyze by who's the editor, you could analyze by hardback versus paperback, you can analyze by all the other data that you have on the book that will help you understand your sales data better. So having your sales data in an account system is good, but it's good if you can tie it also to your title information. Uh, the other super important area is royalties. So if your sales data comes into a system like this, you can put your contracts in, and we do use that uh, at NUS Press. You can put your contracts in, describe your contracts, and then use the system to generate your royalty reports, which uh, saves a heck of a lot of time. But let's not dig into that stuff yet. The point is that the title management system is really, it, it just turns out to be the most central data uh, that, that we have. Um, and let me come back to the PowerPoint where we'll talk about that a bit more. So we've added, we've done, we've added some data, sales rights information and so on. So um, where is your data now? Um, ah, okay, Said Ali is also asking about other kinds of rights. So uh, what I was looking at was actually sales rights for the print, for the books. Um, but of course there's all the, what we call subsidiary rights or all the other rights, film rights, um, uh, photocopy rights like the class license and all of that, audiobook rights, ebook rights, and so on. Uh, those can be tracked, but that's, that's a different module in the system that we're, we're not currently using. But the sales rights is something that all, most of your partners need, right? Frankfurt, in the examples I showed you, Overdrive wanted that and Frankfurt wanted that. So that's pretty, that's pretty much basic. 
um, uh, for basic metadata. Is this book available on sale in that territory? Um, the other rights can be tracked in these systems. Uh, there's also dedicated systems that just work on such questions, but the, you'll still need your title information in order to make that robust. Um, and do you include royalty in the rights categories? I'm not sure quite what you, what you mean by that, uh, Said Ali, but um, um, we, if we, if we sell, uh, if we sell rights, say that we sell the rights to an American publisher for a book, we would um, indicate that we don't have the rights for the book in our metadata, but I would put that contract in our royalties system. So I would know that um, I'm, uh, I am actually expecting to be paid by the American publisher. I got paid a lump sum advance and I'm expecting to be paid X percent on the sales. So that would go into the royalty system, which I'm, I'm not going to dig into now. So where is your metadata now? Well, you all, uh, some of you shared a little bit about that. You all have it in different places. Um, but it's everywhere. It's all around you. You're surrounded by metadata. You are metadata professionals, just maybe not quite as systematic as you uh, could be about it. So like we looked at, it's on the cover. It's on the copyright page. The cataloging and publication data that we get from National Library will give us um, the LLC number, right? That's what... Um, Part of the one issue we have with NLB is they use a slightly non-standard cataloging system. Um, so it's, yeah, anyway, that's getting into the weeds. It's in your ABIs and your catalogs. I mean, creating your catalog is gathering the metadata and putting it in. It's on your website, of course. It's on your spreadsheet. It's on the production team spreadsheet. It's in the editor's file, Word document. It's in whatever databases you use for royalties and other systems. It's in the filing cabinet, in the storage room. Uh, it's in catalogs. It's everywhere. Um, but the trick is to be as efficient as we can be. And I think most of you are already totally on board with wanting that. And I'm sorry if I'm only giving you hints about how to get there. We were going to start with, you know, just um, uh, uh, an understanding of the overall environment. So this is uh, a diagram I did in 2012. I haven't seen much reason to change it, frankly. Um, I would add JSON to the formats of, that the data could be in. But uh, the ideal, I think, I mean, to, to, uh, is that you're getting metadata. Uh, the most important thing to take away from this slide is that you're, you're getting metadata at every stage of working on the book from when you first dream up the book or you first talk to an author and say, hey, we should do that. You're already thinking about the author, right? Obviously, you're thinking about the title, you're thinking about the description, you're thinking about the category, the price, the format, all of that stuff you're beginning to, you may not have decided eventually, but you're thinking about it. You should write that down, right? You probably do write that down somewhere. Uh, we use a wiki for the early stages because it's less structured, you know, just whatever we're thinking about a particular book. Okay, start a wiki page on that book. You, we may not publish it, but we have the page where we're thinking about it. Then as the book comes through, the manuscript comes in, you start editing, you start commissioning, um, you start working together, you're generating lots and lots of data. And often that's just kept in the editor's own file. It's really valuable if you can share that into a single system. If you're acquiring photographs for use do you have the right to sell that? If you sell a Chinese translation for your book, can you give them the photograph? Maybe not. Maybe you only got the rights to use that photograph in your own English language edition of the book. So, you know, this affects your ability to sell the rights. So that information from the editor who got the picture or the author who got the picture has to come into your system. Of course, when you're creating marketing information, you, um, you are creating lots of metadata. Uh, and then post-pub, post-publication, metadata continues to flow in. And this is one of the key pain points and, and things that you need to figure out how to do. Say your book wins the Singapore Book Awards. You need to include that in the metadata of the book. Um, that's really important data. The library, Singapore National Library has told us, oh, we want to be sure that we have, you know, enough copies of all of your award winners. So publishers, 
I mean, SBA pay will do our part. We'll send them the data, but think there'll be lots of other partners like that who um, want to know uh, about this information. So even after publication, you still need to be feeding this in. And from your system, that information needs to be flowing to the different partners. Um, so your single system could be driving your website. It could be driving um, other websites. Now, the main way that we share it with our partners is through a standard called Onyx. And we, uh, some of us on the call are already using Onyx a little bit. So Onyx is a standard developed to, it's a, what they call an EDI standard, electric data interchange, I guess. It's been around in IT for a long time. But it's a way of share, a standard way of sharing information between partners. So um, we do it manually. We fill out those blasted spreadsheets. But if we have enough, a uh, robust enough system, we can create an Onyx file which then can be automatically shared with partners. And so that's really when you start to take pain out of the system. So you set everything up once a week, your Onyx file updates with your supplier. It can be all the data. Sometimes with some partners, they, they don't use our Onyx, full Onyx feed, but they use the system as an easy way to get book covers because it just you know, sends the big files by FTP. So you can use Onyx standard for subsets of the information. But the ideal is, yep, all my data is here. It's clean. I have one source. And um, I send it automatically to all of my partners once a week. And uh, I have a pre-flight system that checks and makes sure all that data is sufficient, correct, before it goes out. Now, the bad news is that because, um, you know, not everybody accepts an Onyx feed, uh, you will still have to do spreadsheets. So we're in this kind of part world where Onyx isn't fully implemented. Um, but the good news, again, is, well, okay, if, even if this partner wants the data in a spreadsheet, say my, my ebook, say Overdrive for ebooks, they won't take Onyx yet, or maybe they won't take Onyx from small publishers like us, but uh, I can set up that spreadsheet. I can set it up in the system so that it will, all I have to do is once every three months or whatever, press a button and I get the new files out in uh, Onyx, in a spreadsheet format, which is the format they want. So I have to train my system to export into their spreadsheets. That's typically not so hard to do some systems might be easier than others. So even though not everybody, I should add, so CSV, I thought when, you know, in 2012, I thought, well, everybody will just adopt Onyx and it'll be the paradise. Well, it turns out to be quite a long journey, not even some quite advanced vendors are not receiving Onyx yet. But doesn't matter, CSV uh, uh, also works. It's just now I have to send data out two ways, but once I have it automated, it's going out. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, reply in the chat if it uh, if it doesn't. If you have any questions about this about this system, I mean about this diagram. Oh my God! You want to look at an Onyx file? <laughs> Said Ali, you're a glutton for punishment. Um, Let's see if I can do that. Um, it's an EDI, right? It's electronic data interchange. So it's not really meant to be read by humans. Um, but I think it's very, uh, I think it um, could be useful to have a look at. Let me show you something else too, uh, before I get into that, before I share the Onyx file. So um, once you have a system like this, and you've got your data in a database and with pretty good, you know, broken down into lots of categories, uh, you can start to reuse the data more efficiently. And let me just give you one example. So we, um, oh, I've got a pop-up again. You're not seeing the pop-up, right? Let's see, new share. Are you seeing the pop-up?
Do you see something that says select template to apply? Yes. Okay, very good. So I don't know why this pop-up is, it's a modal and the other one was a browser window, I don't know. So um, here are um, some templates for creating uh, AIs. Here's some for creating order forms. Here's some for creating catalogs, okay? Uh, so once you have all of that, I can create, if I'm sending my books to lightning source for printing on demand, I already have a template here that I can uh, put the data into. But let me just show you one template here first, which is the AI template. And I'm going to open up another web window. You guys see that? This is... Um, basically taken all of the information from the database uh, in XML format. It's using something called an XLST transform, uh, transform. Sean may be the only person who knows about that. Uh, and it's throwing it into a page, in this case, a web page. And it shows me, so it makes my creation of the ABIs automatic. Maybe not perfectly automatic, but because, you know, actually, if I want to, my ISBN number, I like to put in dashes between the different parts because they actually do have meaning, as we discovered recently. So I'm, I, I'm not sure I've done that correctly. I would want to check. But sometimes I might edit a little bit or I get an ugly widow here or something and I want to edit. Um, I can put, depending on where I'm sending this, I can decide to put my subjects in. Yeah, you see now I've got Singapore and Malaysia memoirs down as subjects. I've got a little bug in the system on the dimensions. I don't know why. It's giving me an extra thing there, but anyway. I did, yeah, I did this myself, so I should, I should know why. Let's say I want to put the U.S. dollar price. Ah, there it is. I have two U.S. dollar prices because I have two different distribution partners that need that information. So I can edit this a little bit, clean it up, tidy it up, and then generate the PDF. Oh, look, I've got related books. Oh, gosh, that's probably too much information. It's not going to fit on the PDF. So let me just edit it out again. Oops. So there you go. There's the PDF. It's, not, it's going to be a bit ugly down here because I need to edit that stuff out. But it has pulled all of this information automatically. So this is a benefit of the system. It's not only creating the spreadsheets and the Onyx files, but you can create lots of other um, related uh, data as well. I, I actually pull that into different formats. You can pull it into a IDML a file, which you can import into InDesign for laying out a catalog. You can pull it into a spreadsheet, which you can use to create. We use that quite a bit to create price lists uh, and lists when we need to, to send out to vendors and stuff. Let me see if I can give you the Onyx file. Create an Onyx file for this type. And I'll see if I can open that. And that's opening. Oh, gosh, it's opening it in my Xcode. I don't want that. Uh, let's open it. Sean Finder, you won't see this, I think. But let me open that with. Um, Okay, since Side Ali wanted to have a look. Um, so I downloaded the file just for that one title. And that was pretty quick. And it's a kind of a text file, it's an XML file, it's a text file. Sorry guys, and here it is. So let me just share that with you. New share. BB Edit Onyx. So there it is. It's XML, so we know that it's XML. What kind of XML is it? It's Onyx, 
a flavor of XML. So here's the reference to the standard. It's XML 3.0. Who's the person who sent it? That's me using Stison's system. And then the rest of this is a sh using the code. So it's not so easy to read. But uh, here we come to our author information. There's his biography. Let me give us. information about the images and so on, information about the subject. So that's the full description of the BISAC code. That's the code itself, the code. Um, so it's not all human readable, right? Some of it is using these codes. I mean, you can look up the codes. Um, theme and subject, you remember, that's just used by NUS Press for our website. And here's the other category system. Here's the description. It is not in HTML, it's in text. And sometimes things like these quote marks and stuff will get scrambled. So that's something you always have to pay attention to. There's the URL for the cover file. I touched it up, it looks like. I have a couple different cover files in there. My publisher code. Website of the publisher, territory, date, publication, rights. That's easy. World. Um, that's what I just did. We did that together. There's my distributor, one of my distributors. Pricing information in ringgit, Singapore dollars and US dollars. My other distributor uh, for the US. So I haven't put my, I, I see my European distributor is missing. Anyway. Does it do auto price? No, because um, you set the prices. So uh, we, for example, don't, uh, we don't do a standard, um, we price in different currencies. We don't just translate. So yes, for Malaysia Ringgit, we use a three, you know, usually we, but there'll be some titles that we want to price a bit more aggressively for Malaysia. So we'll lower it. We'll actually make it less than the Sing dollar equivalent. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's not automated because publishers might want to do their, uh, do their system. Nova, yeah, this is, uh, this is your territory, right? Um, so, uh, here you are. So the next level will be for those of us who are kind of already in there, uh, what, um, what questions do we have and how do we evolve a Singapore standard that will, um, suit uh, us and our, our books. And, you know, I, I still, I've been working with Onyx for five years now. So yeah, something like that. I still have lots of questions. There are many different categories for dates and availability. The UK uses some methods and the US uses others and stuff like that. So there's lots of uh, information. Um, there's, you know, once you get into the detail, there's lots of information we need to share and learn from each other. And so look forward to that. Um, any other questions about the system? Or about Onyx? So, so moving on, uh, I'm just going to do one more topic. Um, and then, so if you have questions, we can, we'll have a general sort of Q&A uh, at the end. So the next, remember I talked about that even bigger marketplace, uh, i.e. the wild internet. So all of this Onyx information is really just book information. But the other big use of metadata will be for your information on the web. Um, and we usually think of this in terms of search engine optimization, but it's a little bit more than that. So Google and the other search engines, you know, they like to, they can give you the results. So these are all the web pages, but if they can, they like to put together a kind of structured window that uh, structures that data. And that tells you 
This is just a phrase, right? So I just searched for this phrase, but Google knows that it's a book. And it gives you, and it says book, and it knows who the author is. Uh, and it tells you it's a book by Steve Herzaka, the author, and when is even the publication date, they know that. And, uh, and that's because um, they've read this metadata and they've um, uh, analyzed it semantically. I mean, they've analyzed the meaning of it. And so they present it. Now, I'd actually prefer if they presented, if I had all of this metadata in a way that Google could read it, they might actually link to my own page as well. Or they might give me a box on top here, which sees more. Uh, you'll know more of what I talk about when I, when I give you a social media example. So um, metadata and structured data is key to search engine optimization. Sorry, that should be SEO. So the other output that you want for your metadata is um, into your web pages and into your social media feeds. Now, um, that requires you linking between your title management system and your web production system. Stison, uh, many companies, including a couple Singapore companies, also use Stison to do their website, so it's automatic. So all of that uh, metadata will also go into the web page search engine optimization. Uh, for others that use other ways of producing your website, you'll have to create those linkages. But because you have the data coming out in XML, in Onyx, or even you can work with whoever is doing your system to create a crosswalk, uh, you can get that information into your web page. This is one standard now, uh, JSON LD, which is emerging as the way, oh, sorry, as the way of uh, including that information. This, is, this area has been moving a lot over the last five years. It was micro formats before and so on. So it's a little bit uh, technical or it's just that it's changing. But this is kind of what it might look like. So this is one uh, set of data about the Lord of the Rings trilogy in a web readable format. Uh, so it's the same information, right? It's the author. Um, it's the birth date, death date of the author, the name of the author. Um, it's actually links here to a standard reference to that author. So there's one, you know, category for that author. It's a book and it links to the world cat listing of that book. It's a trilogy and the trilogy has three books, return of the King, the two tower, etc. So this information would be embedded in the web page, and it would help the search engines understand, uh, what this, uh, information is because it gives it a structure and it ties it to a scheme, schema.org, that tells, that, that tells you what it is. So schema.org, if you go to it, uh, it will show, I don't think I, I put a screenshot in, it will, um, I could, yeah, it will, it, 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 it's a kind of cooperative that all the big internet companies are involved in. And it's a way of creating a standard to describe certain things on the internet so that the date we know what the data is if it's just a web page you know it says h1 h2 for head different levels of headings and paragraph it doesn't have in it doesn't have metadata it doesn't tell you that that is a title of a book with this sort of system that information is on the web page and so your search engines can use it and your social media can use it and you can use it for all sorts of uh sharing of data across platforms it's particularly useful for social media. And let me just uh, show you a quick example. So on Twitter, if I want to tweet about a book and I've here, I've tweeted my, my distributors page for the book and I tweet about it and all it gets is a URL, right? So I can tweet that and it'll be a link and some people might link to it or they might not. But if I was MIT press, and I linked to that page on my website, it pulls up this window, what they call a card, a social media card. And that's got a graphic, it's got the title, and it's got a description of the book, and it's got the link <laughs> to sell it as well. So um, that's 
powerful, right? So when, you, when somebody wants to retweet or Facebook post or whatever, um, you're controlling the information that then will get carried along with that tweet. Twitter knows because, and here's the data that's in the MIT website. I went and had a look. Here's the data. It's, so it's meta, uh-huh, metadata uh, that's in the HTML. In this case, it's information about the page to tell you that this page is about a book. And uh, it's specific information configured as Twitter likes it. So it gives you um, the name of the Twitter account that's associated with this information, the link, uh, what kind of content it is. It's a book. Uh, what's the title and the description. So again, your social media will have more juice. It'll have more effect. It'll be more powerful if you can include metadata into your social feed, media feed. You can put that stuff. There's ways to do that in your website. But unless you have a system uh, to automatically feed in, that's like way too much work. It's not going to happen. So uh, the trick is to get uh, your metadata into a system, get those, you know, make that work of sending out the spreadsheets much easier so that you just have to set it up once and you can send out again and again without worrying. Get as many of your partners as you can on Onyx so that it's done without even worrying about it. You just, now I'm not saying there's not a lot of work because you still have to take care of your own data. And that's a lot of work because, you know, some piece of information goes missing. The head of sales decided to change the price, but the person running the metadata doesn't know. Marketing got a great review, but they have to tell, they have to get that information into the system. This the metadata work never goes away because it's, you know, information about your books. But getting it out there will be much easier if you have the system. And then the next level would be to be able to actually talk to your web pages and your social media presence so that you can really uh, make sure that you're controlling the information about the book. Now, Facebook and some of the others will, in some cases, will create cards for you. And um, we use Shopify for our website and Shopify does some of that work in the background as well, but not as well as I'd like. So that's where I'm gonna stop for now. It's uh, been an hour and 25 minutes. Um, do, uh, yeah, any, any further questions? Anything you'd like to look at again? Uh, any questions you have about the topic, about the different, the specific system that we use? Let me know. If you can't think of something now, um, feel free to email me. At, uh, that, at that address. So yeah, I know it's kind of, we're kind of at the frustrating point of like, okay, I kind of, yeah. Kind of think I want to, ah, so yeah, that's a good point. Said Ali asked a good question, SPPA data system. So um, what we're creating at the SBPA level is a way of presenting all of the Singapore data uh, to the rest of the world. We are not creating a system for the companies to use. But, but <laughs> we're going to get halfway there or part of the way there. So what we're doing is by pulling information, we're working with the National Library and we're going to be pulling the information. See, the library all, already has a lot of your metadata, right? Because you've given it to them. I mean, you always are the first person to have it. You've given it to the library, they've added their cataloging information to it. They're going to send us that data in a way that you can download and use into your system. So you could use the SBPA system, I think, as your main system because we will have exports into CSV and so on. So you could use it, but it's actually more designed to gather all of the information for all Singapore books. So it doesn't quite solve the problem uh, for the individual company. 
it should make it easier for you to gather all of that information. And you could maybe as a start kind of use it as your first system, but it's not going to give you all the other advantages that having your own system would. So the next step for SBPA is to try to figure out what our members need uh, and see if we can help them uh, get their own title management systems. The good news is, I don't know if Jason uh, made it onto the call, but the, the good news is that creating these systems uh, for our own companies is the sort of work which is productivity, which would attract a government grant. Um, and um, uh, because that's, you know, improving your productivity, but we couldn't apply on behalf of all of our members to create systems for all of our members. Companies have to do that individually, but of course you'll be able to reference the SBPA project. We'll be able to support you in this uh, high level sphere. Um, and hopefully, I mean, this is something we, uh, we would still work on. We'll be able to offer a kind of uh, package price for um, uh, some of these systems, in particular the Dyson system uh, that I showed you. So, but that's a little bit akandatan. I think we, we wanted to understand what the needs were of the publishers before we get into that. So SBPA system, you'll be able to see your data, you'll be able to update it. Uh, you'll be able to download the spreadsheet from that that you can share to somebody else. So it'll, it'll get you probably 80% of the way there, but it's not really designed to be your solution. Nova, anything to add from your experience of, of doing all of this? Anything that I skipped? made sound too easy. So is made it metadata actually the most boring subject in publishing? Have you have I made everybody go to sleep. <laughs> I'm sorry if I have. Or are you just contemplating how much work it is? Um, it is, but I can tell you, you will save time if you can be more and more systematic um, about it. Ali, question? Okay, guys, if oh, something more is coming in. Um, Stison is free for under 200, under 200 titles. So um, it's really a good way to start. After that, uh, it goes up to something like 50 pounds. Uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly. What I can tell you is I think we'll be able to offer a very, if we can close the deal, if we find that there's sufficient demand uh, from publishers, we can offer a very attractive price. I mean, more in the sort of uh, 30, 40, uh, tens of dollars a month anyway, sort of um, uh, price point. But like I said, free for under 200. So it's a great way to get, to get going. So these systems can be super expensive. Um, you know, some of them are, especially if they plug into your account system and all of that can be more, much more expensive. Yeah, Nova's raised the main point. Some systems don't accept Onyx. So that's the biggest frustration. I think from even from 2012, I thought by 2020, everybody would be accepting Onyx. So um, uh, yeah, we still have to feed it manually, but hopefully at least you are able to create a system so you can do a one button creation of uh, the CSV file, the spreadsheet file.
And the more of us who have the capability of sending an Onyx file, the more they will, uh, our partners will see the logic of investing to ingest the Onyx file. So the more of us who do it, I think then there'll be a kind of network effect. Yeah, um, we can, uh, uh, Styson is very happy to do that. I think we just wanted to get consensus on the SBPA side, whether SBPA wanted to be involved uh, in, in a, a, an arrangement to um, do that. And I think we're also waiting to know how it would plug into the book, uh, the SBPA book data project. So let me, let, let's just say Akan Datang on that a little bit. Um, and, um, but I'm sure any vendor, I mean, any vendor will be happy to do a demo for any publisher who inquires. Um, so you can, you can do that on an individual basis, but as an SPPA level. Yes, the SPPA data system will create Onyx files and it will ingest Onyx files. That's in, written into the requirements of the system that the vendors are beginning to work on now. Good question, Nova. Yeah. We don't want to create another uh, vendor who we have to send things manually to. But if you need to send things manually, we'll try to make it as easy as possible uh, to do so. Uh, NLB, doesn't, um, NLB doesn't use Onyx files. Onyx files are really for the book trade. Um, the NLB will take a spreadsheet uh, and it'll take you know, you filling in the form or they'll, you send them the book and they'll do the cataloging from the book. So it's not really, a, if we go back to that diagram, um, NLB doesn't quite feature. They don't really use Onyx, you yeah. know. So uh, this over here on the side on this diagram is the world of libraries. Mark is the standard that um, libraries have been using to share the catalog information for their purposes. So it's a different standard. It's a library standard. Um, I believe the SBPA, I, uh, I can't remember 100%, but I'm pretty sure that the SBPA system will uh, also export Mark files. So if this is SBPA, uh, it will actually send MARC files, which makes it easier for libraries to buy the books because they already get the catalog. They don't have to create their own catalog MARC file. They can download your MARC files and put them into their card catalog. And OPAC is just a name for a uh, card catalog, online a card catalog. Can't remember what it stands for. Online public access catalog, I think. So we don't know how, Said Ali's asking about school libraries. We don't know exactly how, I mean, that's what we're trying to work with Civica and so on, um, uh, and to understand how the school libraries will actually uh, buy the books. Um, they, um, uh, I, I, we presume at the moment that it'll be different systems. So Civica may accept an Onyx file, uh, because they supply the libraries uh, with books and book information. But it may be that we also use our system to, right now we create, those of you who are not aware, the SBBA creates a library catalog, which is a books that are suitable for, locally published books that are suitable for Singapore libraries. And we do that manually. So we ask you all to send us spreadsheets and then we centrally compile the spreadsheets and uh, Ulrich and Cecilia can tell you uh, what a pain that is. Uh, we've, you know, some of our members have helped us put it all together and the spreadsheets we get from everybody are all over the place and it's a hell of a lot of work. And um, so it's quite difficult. With this system, um, if we can get in you, 
get you into the system, then we'll be able to create that catalog much more easily. We could create a special web version of it, right? A Singapore content for school libraries web page, which would highlight um, the books that are suitable for school libraries. Um, and we could create the printed catalog much more easily by using some of those structured data exports. So that's very much the goal that um, whatever information uh, preference the school libraries have, whether we want to, they would like to see a printed catalog, whether they'd like to go to a web page, or whether they'd like to look at a database run by Civic or another partner, we need to be able to get them the information into that format. Nova asks another question. Could we sh send our Onyx to SBPA and they share to platforms such as LSI and iPage? Um, that's an interesting question. We have talked about sharing that information to class uh, and to some, other, uh, to some other vendors, Amazon, for example. Um, I think we'd have to look case by case at the vendors and it would uh, make sense whether that information is, um, you know, how, whether there's vendor, whether there's publisher specific data inside there. So uh, if there is, it may be hard to, like for LSI, there might be information that um, you don't share otherwise, or there may be cost information that LSI includes that, you, you know, I don't know. So we would, we would have to study that, but yeah, we definitely contemplated that we would, that would be part of a service of the platform is to send it to third parties for sure. I mean, the other use case is for bookshops, right? Right now you go to the independent bookshops, they're typing in, they're cutting and pasting book information from other places uh, into their system, whereas hopefully we'll make it much easier. Said Ali is asking Nova, what is LSI and iPage? That's a good question because actually, I don't know about what is iPage either. LSI I assume is Lightning Source, which is a, a big print on demand vendor, which is operating around the world. Is that correct, Nova? And what is iPage exactly? Ah, Ingram, okay, got it. So yeah, I don't work directly uh, with Ingram, uh, I go through my U.S. distributor. So we send our data to our U.S. distributor. Actually, we're still with them. We're testing Onyx, but we're at the moment still using CSV files. And then they send it to Ingram. So I haven't been exposed to that platform myself. So that'll be something, you know, that you, uh, every publisher will decide. But definitely the idea is that we can create a single source I mean, I'll give you an example. We got a call one day from um, the Asia Center, New Asia Center in Korea, new big library, which is focusing on collecting books from all over Asia. And they said, oh, we want to acquire books from Singapore. Please send us a list of all the books in print in Singapore. And we couldn't do it. Uh, even if we sort of got li the National, uh, National Library to give us their publication SG data, it wouldn't have price. It wouldn't have ISBN. It wouldn't work. So... Uh, we do get these sorts of inquiries, right? Um, so yeah, there will be places that we definitely will send aggregate Singapore book information to, as well as making it available on the web and so on. Okay guys, 11.42, we have done two hours and 40 minutes. That's pretty good for a Zoom meeting. I'm going to just ask for a last question. Uh, where are Styson books share the metadata to? Okay, so Styson itself as a, as a software as a service vendor, they don't actually, sh they, they leave it to us to share the data. So they leave it to their clients, the publishers, to know where to share the data. But they do create tools. I didn't show you that part of the product but they do create tools where we can share the data. So if I want to send to iPage, for example, 
I just have to set up a, an automatic FTP feed that will send my Onyx to, in, to iPage. And um, then it will run on Stison's system and once a week or whatever schedule I set, the system will send that data to them. So I have to set it up. I have to, there are a few variables, you know, do they want text or do they want HTML for the book description sort of thing? You probably want to test it with them a couple times. Are they receiving it well? Okay, once everything is running, it's automatic, then you don't have to think about it. So Stison as a vendor won't do that sending of the data. They leave it to us to do as publishers, but they give us the tools um, to share that. Great. So uh, more to come. Uh, Melvin, you'll hear from next, and he will give you more information about the SBPA system. I think he'll share his view on metadata as a, uh, both a library supplier and a trade distributor. So it's a kind of bigger headache even for him maybe than for publishers because he's got metadata coming in from multiple sources and needs to send it out to a, a lot more folks. Uh, than we do as publishers. So look forward to that. And um, definitely we'll figure out how to reach out to you probably one by one and sort of see what appetite there is for um, working more closely and coordinating a bit more with the vendors um, and to offer, uh, you know, to help companies, individual companies find the right solutions for, we don't want to enforce one vendor on everybody, but we could offer a kind of reseller arrangement. So we'll work, we'll work through that. And you'll hear about that in the next uh, couple months or so. So this is meant to just be kind of kick off for the journey. Thank you very much for your patience. Oh, my God, we still got 20 people on the call. So that, that's great. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody.